what drew you to Arche and their story and made you want to document their journey? Oh my goodness. Well, when you meet Arche, Arche is a force of nature. And I like to say, you know, Arche takes you to places where you just can't believe he's taking you. And I call it Planet Arche. And you've seen the movie, right, Dana? So you know what I mean. He, there is, with Arche, he has the ability to connect people that you would never expect would ever dialogue. And I first heard about this story, I'm a rower, and so I heard about this team from the west side of Chicago and how somebody had written and self-published a memoir about being captain of, t of a team from the west side. And I remember thinking, yeah, that, that didn't happen. No such thing, right? Fake news. Um, and I order Arshay's book, read it, and uh, take to cyberspace. You know, I tweet out to at, at, at Arshay Cooper, what a compelling read. And a tweet comes back, my phone rings, it's Arshay Cooper. <laughs> and Arshay said, so, and I said, yes. And that, there, <laughs> there you have it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just like that. Well, Arshay, coming from the west side of Chicago in the 90s where, where gang violence was at an all-time high and really no one is seeing another way out, what attracted you to rowing specifically? Yeah, I think when this guy came to my school um, and he talked about the sport, at first I said, no, I was like, I'm not doing this. No way. No one looks like me. But when he talked about the sport and what it offers to travel, that you race once in your city and every race is, is out of town. I was like, wow, I've never been anywhere. And he talked about a brotherhood that you would build by building connection with these guys in the water every single day outside of the community downtown for a little while. And I was like, wow, I only have one friend, right? And then he talked about the academic support and all the things and the character that is built through this sport. It was, it was an easy yes for me because, you know, I wasn't a part of any other team. I had no other friends, but I just wanted to go somewhere. And, um, and, and it was just passionate mentors and passionate coaches who understood our community, who understood us. And, um, and, and it was um, open to taking us on a journey. And some members of the crew were actually from rival gangs, correct? So how did they get recruited? And once they were recruited, what were some of the methods used to bring this brotherhood together? Yeah, I think first, you know, if you talk to some of the guys, they was like, we just wanted pizza and travel, right? <laughs> and that was enough to catch say, all right, uh, you know, I got to bring one of my guys and so no one jumps to me. I know there's different guys in the gang, but once we got to the boathouse, right? And we was pushed out in open water. There was a lot of fear there, right? A lot of fear. And then survival mode kicks in and it tells you to get back to the dock safely, we have to pull for each other. And when you learn to pull for each other, you have to listen. You have to listen to the cops and listen to the coach. And once we started listening, the coach voice was speaking positive words into our lives. Sit tall, breathe, you belong here. Um, you're gonna graduate high school, you're gonna make it to college, you're gonna be amazing, you're gonna be great. And, and that was, and, and then just the, the healing power of the water, the rhythm, the movement, right? Uh, the peace that the water brings. Being downtown for the first time for most of us and out of our environment where we didn't have to be tough. Then we, we didn't have nothing to prove in front of our friends because we were alone there. And we learned to trust each other. We saw fear in each other, we saw, um, uh, the hope in each other's eyes. And I think it was there being isolated where we learned to connect and build a brotherhood and a way in our travels where we were the only ones that looked like us where we said, hey, we have to watch each other's back. And that's where the love uh, and the brotherhood um, was, was built. In the documentary, you discuss the racism and discrimination that you guys experienced, especially being joining this white sport but was there also backlash from your black peers or just your community oh yeah it was a lot <laughs> it was you know it was coaches that said it wasn't a real sport you know join football team join the basketball team get out of there it was the guy singing row 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 your boat in the hallway laughing at us right it was guys saying oh those guys got you rowing boats like y'all slaves and slave ships it was a lot of heat it was like don't you, have, you should have nothing to do with this sport, but, you know, we saw the success every day of learning how to swim, right? Um, traveling, 
um, the academic support, taking the entrepreneurship classes, right? Finally being downtown and exploring. We saw the success every day and we knew that we were changing, so it was enough to, to stick it out. And now for the documentary, there is quite the A-list team contributing to this documentary, including Common, Grant Hill, Dwayne Wade, Ninth Wonder. So how did this dream team come together? I, you know, part of it was sometimes you're there when the bus comes, right? And uh, Grant yeah. Hill in particular, he and I have known each other. He was actually in one of my earlier films uh, called Apple Pie. And so he and I have been friends for a long time. And um, I said, so Grant, you know, what do you think about this story? And he's like, yeah, I don't believe it ever existed, right? Sort of my <laughs> first my first reaction, I'm like, oh, you got to meet Arche. And Grant was like, boom, I'm in. And then he brought Dwayne, right? And, and things started to happen. And Ninth was just what a, you know, common the sort of majesty, the majesty of his voice and his craft that he lends to this project is just, right, grabs you by the throat. And Ninth Wonder and sort of the, the beauty of the hip hop score, right, and the sensitivity, um, it's been so, it was so exciting for Arche and I to go be in studio with Ninth and see him in turn mentor these young hip hop artists. And it was just, boy, was that, that was a magical set of days for us. And I think what resonated, I think, for all of our partners on this film was the fact that this was an unbelievably positive story, right? That every human, even whose voice is unrepresented, whose voice is not heard, whose voice is often not valued, has a profoundly beautiful story. And I think that is why, right, we, we were able to build such an extraordinary team around this, this, I was gonna say this documentary, it's really a movement, a mission, right? When you look back at what you have accomplished and the impact being the first black rowing crew um, in the country, what does that mean to you? And how do you express the significance of this accomplishment to your children? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I didn't think of it as history, but I thought of it the way, you know, there's a quote from Rosa Parks that said, I didn't know I was making history. I just knew that I can't give up, right? And it was living every day in a neighborhood that you couldn't really see hope, right? Uh, but um, with access and opportunity every day, uh, seeing that change in your life and in other folks' life allowed you to just keep going and keep fighting. So I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's really just explaining to them the power of not giving up and the power of, of trusting, right? Um, and, and, the, and, and the gift that I think the one thing that we all uh, share in common with me and the guys is understanding that we must do it afraid, that there are so many things happen. There's so many uh, violence in the neighborhood, but we still go outside, right? We, we still take chances when we go and play basketball, or go into a neighborhood where people don't look like us. So when we learn how to swim or we are pushed out in an open boat where you may very well drown, right? And I think, it, you know, to, to, to my kids and to the other guys and their kids, is the biggest lesson is always do it afraid and have faith, right? Because before me, there was history still being made and being able to look at people who look like me and King and uh, Jesse Owens and all these great leaders allowed me to go forward. So it's always looking at the history that was made before you that allow us to keep going forward. Mary, you spoke on this a little bit, but um, what does it mean to you to be able to give the story of resilience and determination a platform that can be used as a tool to inspire others? You know, this is where, honestly, like Arche has taken us on a journey that's been unbelievable. And I really view my role as um, I build the scaffolding, right? That, that's my job. I build the risers, I build the platform. And this is Arche, it's his story. It's that of his teammates. And those are the voices that are amplified. Not my story, not my voice, but this is Arche. And he is extending to a new generation of young people what it means to stand up and say, this is how I'm going to combat injustice. This is what I'm going to change. And again, Arche has the most remarkable opportunity to put people in a room, 
that you never think would come together. And I get like, when Arshay told me he was gonna reach out to the Chicago Police Department, right? We were talking about toxicity in a series of interviews with law enforcement and Arshay called me and said, this is what I'm thinking of doing. The hair on the back of my neck went up and I said, who does something like that? How extraordinary. And to be part of this wave, right? That, and, and really a wave of sort of positivity and hope that Arshay brings with him everywhere he goes. We're seeing, I'm seeing Arshay in real time change hearts and minds. And he is doing that not just with young people in these underrepresented neighborhoods. He is doing this with the most entrenched people who live in the world of privilege, right? Who have never really come into contact with neighborhoods like the West Side. And to see him connect the dots for them on their obligation to do more um, has been so exciting. Yeah, I, I think a most beautiful thing comes at such an important time. I know I've never been to Chicago and it's just been discussed a lot lately because of the violence. And I just wanted to ask, you know, a lot of outsiders speak on Chicago and they've never ever been there. And they're trying to find a solution to the, the poverty, the violence um, that's happening. So Arshay, being a native, what do you feel is the most pressing matter? What, what should be the focus? Is it education? Is it providing more sports and activities? What do you believe? Yeah, it's education. It's starting with the uh, education. And I think it's acknowledging, right, that Chicago is the way it is because of, the, because of um, our people being enslaved, because of segregation, because of Jim Crow laws, because of our family moving uh, away from the South because it was so bad, right? and then being placed in, in, in a community where they can't take out loans, right? They, they can't get a mortgage, they can't advance because of the color of their skin. So acknowledging that first and put, reinvesting, as Mary would say, in these communities, right? People are privileged um, uh, reinvesting in these uh, communities. I think that is a start, I think it starts again with education, like, you know, property tax pays for this, the, the school system, right? And like Mary would say that I think my taxes should not should go beyond 10 miles. Right. And I think it, it's reinvesting in that way. And also, again, you saw in the film that when they tore down the YMCA, a lot of kids ran to the streets, right? 150 kids was out in the street game banging. And then Rowan came, Alvin and other guys turned to the sport because the opportunity was there. So I believe access and opportunity um, really changes lives. And if you will put a rowing team in every public school, that would have been more Arshay Alvin, Malcolm's, and Preston's in the city of Chicago. And I think, um, you know, it's a lot happening. But honestly, honestly, there's a lot of good. There's a lot of Arshay stories in Chicago that no one's highlighting. There have been leaders and counselors and teachers who have really, really done some great things in Chicago. And I wish we can highlight those things more. And every day, they're there. They're holding each other accountable and they grinding it out and, um, and it's still more, work, still more work to do. It's true as of now, the only news that seems to really be getting attention is the bad news coming from Chicago. So I wanted to understand, is it like as bad as it seems or are there these moments, these little pockets of success stories and positive stories coming from Chicago? I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's rough. You know, it's, it, 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 it is hard, right? Um, but like I said, I have never, I worked with gangs for a long time in the early 2000s, and I have never met a gang member um, that got an opportunity to get a job and didn't say, no, I want to stay in the streets. Right. Never. They all said, okay, awesome. Yes, I would do it. I want to feed my kids, and I don't want to have to watch over my back. You know, and... It is rough because there's not a lot of opportunities, right? And there's a big disconnect with those who serve and protect. And the leadership is, is usually not that great. And so uh, there, there's rough parts. But there's a, like I said, there's a lot of great things. You remember, it took our story 22 years to be told, right? And it was a great story, an amazing story. There's so many of those stories that are not being told. And it exists in, on the west side of Chicago.